guess what? You get a call at 10 o'clock at night. Hey, we need 50 pizzas. Diana Ross is, you know, for her show. Or Paul McCartney comes into Fox. We need 50 vegetarian pizzas delivered to the Fox. You know, Kid Rock shoots a video at State Fair. We need 50 pizzas. Eminem launches 8 Mile movie. Uh, Club Blue, we need 100 pizzas. And they're calling you. They're calling buddies. And without any notice. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan, where we talk to ordinary Michiganders who are doing some pretty extraordinary things. And if it sounds like I'm stumbling over my words, I probably am because I am drooling right now. If there's one thing I love, and that is the smell of pizza. And today I'm sitting in uh, Buddy's Pizza, which is home of the Detroit-style pizza. And I want to explore all of this because this is just something that's known as a national level, something that we can definitely be proud of as Michiganders. Sitting with me today is the chief brand officer of Buddy's Pizza, and that would be Wesley Piccola. Wesley, how are you? Hi, Cliff. How are you? I'm happy do- to be here. Great. I'm happy to have you. And did I get your last name right? A little bit. A little bit? Piccola. 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 Okay. Piccola. Okay. So... Wesley, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and where you grew up? Oh, sure. So I grew up on the east side of Detroit. Uh, Originally, our family came to the United States in 1964. We left Poland, our whole family. I had four siblings and my mom and dad. Their brothers were in America, and they, through the years, tried to get us to move, and it was very difficult at the time, but obviously they made it happen. So in 1964, we moved to Hamtramck, which is on the border of Detroit, and then I, we then moved to Detroit, and it so happened that where we moved, I was probably a mile and a half from what was the original buddies, unbeknown to me at the time. Right. But we only lived a mile and a half from there, so that's where I originally grew up. And uh, So uh, let me ask this question here, just to explore it a little bit. Why Detroit? I mean, you got the whole United States you could have moved to, but your family picked Detroit. Why? Well, Hamtramck, if... Anyone knows the history of Hamtramck, it was primarily Polish at the time. It's actually go. 100% Muslim now, but back then, people went to New York, people went to certain parts of Chicago, and then Hamtramck is where our family lived, and that's the area they were familiar with. And then, of course, we they had a house for us, a flat in Hamtramck, and we lived on a lower flat, all of us, <laughs> three to the bed. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that, that, was, that was how it all started. And, of course, I was six years old when I came here, so you know, we had language issues. And it just so happened my father was a tailor, and he was able to do some work for the nuns and the priests. So after hours, a lot of the nuns would teach us how to speak English at the convent. So, you know, that's kind of how we got the schooling to learn the language and not to get too far back in, in the school system because we didn't speak. That's great. I love that. So let's talk about the history of Buddies. How did it first get started? When did it first get started? Sure. So Buddies originated at Six Mile Cone in Detroit. It was, it was a house bar, what's called a house bar. It was a bar in front, a house in the back. People resided there. So probably in the 20s, uh, between 20, 1920 and 1930, it was this little house bar that eventually became sort of a blind pig when they, during Prohibition. Right. When Prohibition ended, it became a little restaurant called Fern's Lunch. It was just a little fern in a window, and it was just a little bar. Around 1946, a gentleman by the name of Gus Guerrero purchased it, and he was uh, Italian, and his wife and his family, and uh, being from Italy, and you know, at the time, there were a lot of uh, veterans that had served, were familiar with Italy, and, you know, he wanted to have more to serve in his little bar than fish and chips and things like that. Certainly. So the idea came, maybe we can do pizza, and of course, because they were Sicilian, they had this version that you can find, it's called sficione, which is like a dough, Ooh. and then you would push meat into the dough, and then you maybe would drizzle a little bit of parm and a little bit of olive oil on it, and it was usually rectangular in shape, similar to like a focaccia bread. Okay. So then, that seems to be the origin of where the Detroit-style pizza came, because Detroit-style pizza is a little different, because you start with dough. Then you press the pepperoni onto the dough, and then you put the cheese on, and then the sauce goes on top. 
which is basically heresy in a pizza world, right? <laughs> yeah, because it is. Because the sauce, sauce always goes first. Yes. Exactly. And so what we'll end up doing is it created this sort of light, crunchy crust because the, the sauce wasn't on the dough. So Ooh. by design, the, the, the dough kind of was not gummy or wasn't sort of saturated by, by the sauce. And the other part that was really interesting was they didn't have any type of pans at the time because there was no rectangular or square pizza at the time. So up and down the streets in Detroit, they had tool and die shops. They didn't have the big automotive suppliers. They had these small groups that used to do the work. And they had these trays there that were called drip trays or, or they used to be inexpensive metal trays that they would use to house like nuts and bolts or if there was a drip, they'd put the tray underneath. So anyways, it was the dimension was like 10 by 14. Right. And then a smaller one that was like 8 by 10 inches. And so somehow this pan got into Gus Guerrero's hands. No one knows exactly how. And they wound up putting the dough into this sort of uh, manufacturing tray, I guess, okay. with maybe two and a half in sides. And they pressed the dough out, and then they baked in it. And it worked. So to this day, the, the story of this pan is that it was not a food service product. It was basically from manufacturing. And to this day, we still use that type of pan. So it's made by a fabricator for us. Certainly. Now, the, the question that I got is, and I appreciate that the, so I, if I understand correctly, so it was the Sicilian style has been square all along. Right. Okay. And this is dating back how far? As far as you can remember, because remember, focaccia was always part of the Italian cuisine. It was a type of bread, but that dough had oil in it, so it was more of a chewier texture. Oh, Specific okay. to Detroit style, and, and Buddy's does original style, because there's a lot of versions of this pizza today. But back then, when Buddy's was around, it was the only place at the time. So it was very specific. It was saltwater yeast. There's no shortening in any type of conditioner in a dough. So that, again, maintained that light, crunchy crust. So it almost has, it's almost a blending of the focaccia and Neapolitan style. Neapolitan style traditionally is saltwater yeast. Gotcha. So the, the magic happens from the flour and the simplicity of that product and then also a great tomato sauce. So, so if you talk about Neapolitan, it's great, fresh San Marzano tomatoes, a double zero flour and the water, and then it creates a great pizza because... Great pizza doesn't have to have, you know, a lot of things on it. It's just like That's great true. bread. Great bread doesn't have a lot in it. That is true. And I think artisan breads now are really popular these days. But if you remember in the old days, you had Wonder Bread and Silver Cup. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, some of the best pizza I've personally had has been over in Italy. And I'm amazed at how often the best pizza has the least amount of ingredients. That's true. Just like even with pasta, if you have a great pasta... And a great tomato sauce. It's not like it's layered with garlic that you can't even talk to anyone after you eat. <laughs> the, the, the show is always the tomatoes. The tomatoes are generally sweet, so you don't need to put sugar in. Right. The salt actually enhances the tomato flavor, which makes it sweet. A lot of people don't know that, but when you add salt, it actually sweetens the tomato. And then, of course, it's, it's, it's real simple. Fresh basil, and if there's any garlic, it's a hint of it, and... Again, it's, it's the balance of the food that makes it great, and it's the initial ingredients that are great. So if you want a great tomato sauce, grow your own tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true, and God, I'm so hungry right now. Okay, so, so Buddy's has introduced this square-style pizza, right? The Detroit-style pizza. Obviously, the reaction to this must have been good. Yes. Because business was doing really well. Talk to us about those like first few years of just getting it out there, getting the name out there, building up the brand. Oh, sure. So basically, Gus Guerrero owned the business 1953. He sold it to Big Jimmy and Little Jimmy. And they were both Italian. And they took buddies from that point to 1970. And so, again, there was only one place at the time. And so it had a big folklore. People would follow it. Again, it's very similar to famous restaurants like Zender's, let's say, in Frankenmuth. People know of that place. So right. Buddy's had a very uh, well-known uh, pizza, and people went there. And it, it had That's what own, they were known for. Yeah, they were known for it. It, was, it had a huge following. In 1970, the Jacobs family bought Buddy's. 
and they fell in love with it just being as customers. And Big Jimmy and Little Jimmy were getting older. They didn't want to run the restaurant anymore as much. So when a Jacobs owned it and bought it in 1970, Detroit had a uh, citywide pizza contest that ran in the city. The Detroit News sponsored it. It was for the best pizza in Detroit. And so Buddy's was one of the entries into this contest, and Buddy's won. Nice. And from that point on, Buddy's Pizza was Detroit's number one square deep dish pizza, as it, as it was referred to at the time. And during the, some of those years, different people branched off that worked for Buddy's, started their own groups. Later on, probably like maybe 10 years ago, Pizza Today, which is an industry trade magazine, decided to do a pizza contest also at one of their shows in Vegas, and they created a category and they called it Detroit style because Chicago style was already out there. California style was out there already, you know, New Haven style, all these yes. kind of styles. Detroit, because no one was paying attention to Detroit, right? It was the Rust Belt, right? Who cared exactly. about Detroit? Yep. And so somebody entered it and then they won the category. I think they were the only one in the contest. And so <laughs> all the all the magazines, we never entered contests, to be honest. But he's right. just kind of stayed to their own little niche there. And then once the contest won, and then they started throwing it out there in publications, and bigger groups started picking it up, it became a industry term now. So it's called Detroit style. And I think people have seen Pizza Hut take it on, and now... Uh, DiGiorno has Detroit on their box. Yes. So if anyone remembers, probably 20 years ago, everyone was taking Detroit off their, <laughs> <laughs> off their branding or off their signs. Now everybody's putting Detroit on. And I got to say that this has actually reached like international levels. And the reason why even Buddy's Pizza fell on my radar in the first place was because a handful of years ago, I got to meet the world champion pizza maker, Tony Yemanyani. He's yes. been on yep. the Food Network, everything else. And he and I were talking, and he asked me where I was from. And I said, oh, I'm originally from Michigan. And he goes, oh, you must love Detroit-style pizza. And I looked at him. I'm like, how in the world do you know about Detroit-style pizza? He goes, man, it's some of the best out there. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because, you know, you don't you – know, I was living in California at the time. You don't drive down the road and see Detroit-style pizza. You, just, you saw Chicago-style. That's right. So all of a sudden, now I'm thinking to myself, there's something going on. So I did not know about this about Well, yeah, this well, he's involved because he was always at the pizza shows in the early days. Oh, he, okay. He used to do the spinning. They used to have, like, rubber discs that they used to spin – then they would have spinning dough contests, and that was part of Pizza Expo. Uh, and he actually has a franchisee in, in Las Vegas where yes. he has a Detroit-style concept. And so, again, there's a lot of different characters that left buddies or other ones kind of, uh, you know, jumped on board and created their own versions. And like anything else, you know, it's like when Ford started the automotive uh, automobile, everyone else created their own you know, but he's obviously given the credit or the Wright brothers or someone. There's always a first, right? Exactly. And then everyone else jumps in and does their own versions, does improvements and changes. But one of the things that Buddy's does that's unique is we've never really departed from the original recipes or what was left at Buddy's. When these different people left, there was always kitchen staff that stayed behind. And so whether someone left or a chef left or someone else, there would always be the full kitchen intact. So Buddy's never moved away from that. So we build the pizzas the very traditional way. The same way you've been doing it way. for decades. We're not putting, like, groups like Jets will put sauce on the dough now and cheese on top. They switch to a mozzarella cheese. They'll put pepperoni on top. We will, um, if a guest wants a pizza made a certain way, we will, of course, do it. But generally speaking, our pizza is still very traditional in the way that we inherited it. And I started there in 1975. And so, of course, we had what we called the old timers, which were five ladies that were sort of the gatekeepers of the recipes. And I saw the picture well, and their arms are huge. That's right. Their arms are huge. And you, you could see, uh, Cliff, that I wasn't going to challenge anybody along the way. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I weighed 150 pounds and I just, I, there's no way. And so, but why would you want to change it? Because, exactly, you know, when you have a brand like Buddies, it's, you know, you, you're, you, you inherit a legacy brand and I don't want to be the first guy that does something where someone says, what were you thinking? And yes. that, that's not, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> right, exactly. For our audience, we're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the explosive growth that Buddies has been seen. We'll see you after the break. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan. I am speaking today with Wesley Pakula. That's right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and we are talking about Buddy's. Actually, we're just talking about pizza and food in general, but we're talking about Buddy's Pizza, the history of it. Before the break, we were talking about uh, how Buddy's Pizza really established a really solid local following. And this brought us up into the 70s. Now we're going to move into the 80s. But the question I got for you first, Wesley, is when did you join the company? Sure. I joined in 1975. Uh, My mother had worked there a few years before that in the kitchen. And they had an opening at the time for dishwashers. I was 16. And uh, I'd never washed dishes in my life. And I'd never worked in a restaurant in my life. I just had a paper route. So basically, I went and applied. And of course, I applied with my friend. My friend uh, couldn't work because it was close to uh, Memorial Day weekend. He had a family trip. So he got called in because he was 18. I was 16. The manager said, have you ever washed dishes? I said, yes, of course. I washed dishes at home. I didn't tell him I never washed dishes at <laughs> home. So anyways, he brought me in. And, of course, they put me in the dish room, which was about three feet by three feet. And I could tell you that I had a lot of help for weeks at a time because people I'm sure felt sorry for me. But at the time, you know, I was in school, I graduated from high school and then went to college at Wayne state in uh, Detroit. And um, again, started there in 75. I think when you talk about buddies and it's local following, I think the next kind of milestone for buddies was in 1980 when uh, besides winning the contest in 1970 and 1980, the Republican convention was in Detroit. Yes, indeed. At Cobo Hall at the time, what it was called. And Ronald Reagan was the candidate. And Buddies was asked. Strohsbeer was also asked. Strohsbeer was doing a beer. And then Buddies Pizza was asked to do the pizza for the press corps. The national and international press corps in the dining area at Cobo Hall, Buddies served and Stroh served. So keep this in mind. People like, you know, Ted Koppel, Barbara Walters, Huntley, Brinkley. I can go down the list of every single person that ever was on air uh, from New York, California, anywhere you can imagine around the, the world, actually, that was covering the convention, was waiting in line for Buddy's Pizza. And the funny thing about this story is we did this for the whole week. And we found out that the gas pressure in the Cobo Hall wasn't strong enough for our pizza ovens. So the ovens wouldn't run at full capacity because we had rented ovens because we were only one location at the time. And so what we had to do is bake the pizzas off at the Six Mile store, which is about 10, 15 minutes from downtown. Right. We had to transport the pizzas from that location. Then we had to go through Secret Service. (laughs) Then we had... People or the press corps waiting at times for an hour to an hour and a half for them to deliver buddies so they could eat. Of course, they were drinking Stroh's beer, so it wasn't so bad. But (laughs) either way, we had signature books that we had the different press people sign in. And I can honestly tell you, every single person that tried the pizza at the time always mentioned better than anything in new york i have to come back to detroit after convention we had so many names that we captured during that moment and i think that was another huge milestone because we got a lot of press corps yes you did uh, coverage and then uh you know we became sponsors of the of the pistons during the bag boy era we we you know they actually they, we had a point promotion where the one game chuck daly actually put the starters back in so they could hit the point promotion and it wound up on the front page of the USA Today where the coach from the opposing team said that you know the Detroit coach was Bush League because he wanted to please the crowd with some local pizza promotion and he put the starters in with two minutes left in the game so this is the power of buddies at the time right Right. and so you had 17,000 people at the palace screaming buddies buddies so when they hit 130 (laughs) points the ticket stub was worth for was worth a free four square cheese pizza oh that's so clever and so we did the same thing with the lions the lions didn't fare as well but we did it on a field goal or a touchdown and of course You know, if there was a field goal or a touchdown, it would be a touchdown buddy, that kind of thing. So we were very 
present in those two sporting groups. And of course, because of national coverage and games and that really kept pushing buddies to the forefront and every it became a household name. And of course the style of pizza became more relevant. So as it, as I said earlier from buddies, pizza became Detroit style pizza. And we were happy with that because we love Detroit. We've operated in Detroit through the whole history of buddies. So why Certainly. not give Detroit, you know, it, it deserves it, right? Cause everyone else was knocking Detroit and we always were proud to, to operate in Detroit. Certainly. And now it's Michigan. We did our Great Lakes Pizza Collection, which we did in honor of the Great Lakes. So we had that going for many years. And we, uh, and we donated back to the Great Lakes Alliance, which helps the lakes and restoration and things like that. So we've always been involved in, in causes much bigger than ourselves because we always felt like if we got involved, other people would see that you don't have to be the biggest kid on the block to do some good. Right. If you do a little, like I always said, you know, to individually we do a little together, we do a lot. Yes. So if everybody just adds a piece to it, it's easy, right? It's like having ten people lift something instead of one or two people struggling. Exactly. And then it becomes easy. And then more people want to do it because it's not as difficult. And speaking of pieces, at some point in time, buddies decided to start expanding. Now, how many locations are you up to now? You're right. We're at 22 locations. We're gonna, Sweet Moses. Yeah. So we opened Alpine not that long ago. Grand Rapids is a great market for buddies, a lot of families. Uh, now, is this franchises that no, you're doing? No, these are or? all privately held. Capital Spring is our uh, operating partner. And so we're still involved with buddies, but we have a lot more expertise with the group. Um, it's a large group that came out of New York, fell in love with buddies, and they support buddies in their growth and with all the different uh, uh, technology and things like that, operational systems. They're very critical, but they've been uh, the catalyst for really of a more aggressive uh, growth plan. Um, and again, we're doing pizzas now in supermarkets. We do frozen pizzas now. We do pizzas that we ship nationwide <laughs> through Gold Belly. So 22 restaurants, I mean, and so we're probably – putting through probably more than 2 million people through a year. Sweet Moses. And so awesome. from a little restaurant that originated on a corner, that was a house bar. And again, you know, you can have an, a very aggressive growth or you can have more of a disciplined growth. Buddies has always veered more towards the you know, more disciplined because of uh, trying to maintain quality and consistency with product. And again, as I said earlier, I don't think anybody wants to be the first guy to mess this up. So we have a very special product that we sort of uh, babysit a little bit. And, uh, and, you know, it takes a lot of work. So. And I definitely, I definitely want to circle back to, to the point you made about quality. Before I do that, what is it that explains the growth of it, because it's not like you just did this one time. I mean, you've done it twenty-two times. So, what is it that that you really attribute to the fact that you're growing? I think it's really some of it is guest-driven. I mean, people been transplanted from Michigan all over the country. And I remember with Chrysler, GM, Ford at the time, everybody got transplanted all over the country. Engineers, you know, automotive industry is big, obviously in the United States, and. All those people that worked in automotive at the time came out of Detroit. And so when they got relocated, guess what? We they were, wanted Buddy's Pizza. Of course, because Chrysler, GM, and Ford were in Detroit, in Hamtramck. All those production plants, GM was downtown. Chrysler was in Auburn Hills. Ford was in Dearborn. There you go. Every one of those places, you know, you had ownership, CEOs, founders, always eating at Buddy's. It wasn't unusual to have what was considered the 11th floor at the time at GM headquarters down on Grand Boulevard, they would come to Buddy's. You could see the suits and back then the, the wingtip shoes. and Nice. The, you know, the, the executives would come in and we had, you know, it wasn't odd to see Henry Ford, or even Lee Iacocca go down the list of the CEOs at the time that would lunch at Buddy's. So, again, a lot of this folklore got transferred about. There's... There's Detroit style in South Korea. There's Detroit style in Toronto. I mean, again, there's people that have gone on and worked 
and there's many people, I'm surprised there aren't more in Japan or places like anywhere you have Michigan transplantees throughout the years. And remember, it's 77 years old. That's right. And the, the, the folklore was much bigger than the amount of locations. Like, you could go around the country and say, have you ever heard of Buddies? Oh, yeah. They think we have a million stores, and we don't. But the brand itself, the name Buddies, because of all the work that we did, not only in communities and sponsorships, and people had a love affair with it because they had so many great moments there. Right. Whether it was playing bocce ball at the original store or coming in, and there were so many proposals at Buddies. We served so many of the Motown acts that used to be in Detroit, whether it was at the Fox or the old Ford Auditorium. Guess what? You get a call at 10 o'clock at night. Hey, we need 50 pizzas. Diana Ross is, you know, for her show. Or Paul McCartney comes into Fox. We need 50 vegetarian pizzas delivered to the Fox. You know, Kid Rock shoots a video at State Fair. We need 50 pizzas. Eminem launches 8 Mile movie uh club blue we need 100 pizzas and they're know, calling you they're calling buddies and without any notice and so these are some of the things and of course when michigan was doing a lot of the film credits when hollywood was coming into michigan to shoot whether it was uh you know whatever the actors were right um miley cyrus for instance one was in garden city living up in one of the bars or you know whatever they shot, Superman, anything that they, or Batman, anything they shot here, uh, buddies would get the call. And nice. in Pontiac, they have the studios there where they do the uh, editing and things like that. And so, we again, we get the call. So I think a lot of that with, as I guess they call them influencers now these days, or but we weren't paying for this. These are people from their hearts that said, we love Detroit. And we love the grit. And people in Michigan are amazing. It's not just Detroit, but it's Michigan. Yes. Right? The greatest people you'll ever meet are from Michigan. And I you, and I if, agree. If anybody travels, you hear that all the time. God, I love Detroit. People are friendly. They're honest. They're sincere. I mean, you meet people in Detroit or anywhere. They're, it's just an honest exchange, which is, which is nice. Yes. You don't always get that everywhere. And yeah. I think that's what Buddies is a little bit. As part of the brand identity, I guess, those are like fancy words, but it's really about the communities you, you uh, serve and the employees that work for you. They're both aligned. And yes. Because you employ people from the community, so it's all intertwined. Your employees are your community. That's and, true. And if you don't support your community, and let's say 80% of your business comes from five, six mile radius of your space, you'd be pretty silly not to invest back into the community that, that you know, helps you make a living. Certainly. So it, it made a lot of sense, but some people lose sight of it. And we didn't. One thing I do want to go back and explore is the, with the, having the 22 locations, and you've talked quite extensively about maintaining the high standards of your product, right? Whether it's the crust, the ingredients, how you make it. How do you maintain that quality when you've got all these locations scattered throughout Michigan? Right, and that's where uh, Capital Spring comes in, and that's where expertise comes in. Technology obviously makes a big difference these days because the training material can all be digital. It can all be on their cell phones. It could all be on their iPads, whatever people carry around now, you can put training videos. Again, it's it's maintaining a culture within your spaces, right? Making sure that the people that work for you are happy and making sure that there's a lot of discretionary effort. You have to earn that. That's leadership. Exactly, right? yes. You, know, you can't force today's employee base is different than when I worked. You could do control and command a long time ago. There's no, no such thing. It has to be collaborative. And people want to do the right thing. If you hire the right people, they're going to want to do the right thing. Exactly, yes. But but, but some people forget the fact that you have to retain people, not just hire people. And if you lose sight of retention, that's where your trouble starts. Because when you start losing good people, you start losing culture. It's like when you lose the generation of, let's say, the generation that went through the wars. There's a certain amount of uh, humility and humbleness and understanding of what the world can look like. And so when you lose those people, you lose some of that wisdom. 
Right. And so in restaurants, what you have, obviously a lot different scale, but I'm saying in restaurants, if you lose tenured staff or you lose people that have been here, you don't get that passing on. It's like great teams. Look at the Celtics or you look at teams that had real legacy. The, the, the players socialize the rookies and you continue yes. this. In the old days, Tigers had an amazing farm system and you would obviously always cultivate those players and the best employees a lot of times are are grown within your organization. They're not because you went and paid an extra two dollars for somebody. That was always the Yankees philosophy, right? George Steinbrenner would yep. go out there and pay the big bucks and they never won back then. But teams that built their players through the farm system and then the, you had veterans that were very um, helpful to rookies always built great teams. So in restaurants you have to maintain a culture of inclusion have to reward the right behaviors. Right. You have to recognize the right behaviors. You have to make it part of the system. And then again, the training is critical. You train every day. You train as you go. It's not a, it's not a classroom. It's not a, uh, a manual. It's what you do every day. So if you're walking in a dining room and there's something on the floor, you pick it up as a manager. So the employees can see that behavior. Yes. And then you go to the bussers and say, you know, I went by, let's say the table's A1. I just walked by A1. There's paper on the floor. You guys need to make sure you got your heads on the floor, not just at eye level, but also looking at the floors. Right. Like that's, you just did, you just did it. And then you educated your bussers that they need to do that. Like, so that's, Kenny Blanchard wrote a book one time, greatest book ever, The One Minute Manager. Right. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. It was the greatest management book ever written to this day. And all it talked about is these 30 second interactions where you inspect what you expect. And it was real simple. And I always loved that. When I was coming up and I was an employee and I had some great managers that had a high uh, level of uh, respect for guests. And they didn't care if you were in, you know, a Coney Island or a lemonade stand or <laughs> a five star <laughs> restaurant. Guest service is guest service. Customers come into your space, they're spending money. You work to the highest level possible under that system. You bet. And we always did that. And whether it was, you know, making sure the silverware was clean, making sure they had enough napkins for that pizza, making sure, you know, that the chairs were wiped and making sure that we had clean bus towels and all those things, again, they have to be reinforced. They have to be trained and you have to have, in my opinion anyways, certain non-negotiables that are in the system that everybody recognizes. TGI Fridays had a great thing. They used to have the clam, clam theory. So the grains of sand were irritants to guests, and every time the clam got an uh, irritant in, in the mouth, let's say, it would open up. And right. you wanted a happy clam, so you wanted a closed <laughs> mouth. So you didn't want any grains of sand in its mouth. Yeah. So the grains of sand were like irritants, right? You go in the bathroom... You know, there's no paper towels, there's no soap, the garbage can's full, there's water all over the sink. I mean, go down the list. So again, we're not perfect, but this is where the focus is. Certainly. And without having the commitment to this and the leadership that expects this, standards can go down pretty quick. Yeah, definitely. So let me ask you this question. For somebody who maybe has never been to Buddies, but I've listened to the show and now I want to try it. So if they're going to come in here, what would be like some of the some of the pizzas that you would recommend? Oh sure. Well, if I was a first time customer to Buddies, just like a great Italian restaurant, I go to a great Italian restaurant. I usually eat their marinara sauce or the bolognese there and the pasta. I never. That's what I start with because I always know because a lot of these base sauces are used for other recipes. If yes, they got they are. a great marinara, chances are everything's great. If they had a great pasta, it's not gummy and it actually has a firmness to it. It has some taste. You know they're buying top-of-the-line stuff. And so with Buddies, if I was a first-time guest, I would come in. I would order an apostle salad, which is what we're known for. Our dressing, again, is almost as famous as the pizza. Yep. It's a vinaigrette that's aged for anywhere from six to eight weeks. It's the old traditional recipe. They're made in gallon containers, shipped to the stores. We, made, Love we have it. a little guy that makes them for us. Gallon is aged you got celery, lemon, spices, things like that. So you get the antipasto salad, which is salami, ham, cheese, our brick cheese in a bowl. You order a cheese and pepperoni pizza 
maybe a super with cheese, onion, green pepper, mushroom, and ham. But the, the reason you order cheese and pepperoni is because the pepperoni is under the cheese. Yes. The pepperoni juice is baked into the dough. And then you order our buddy brew. Our buddy brew, if you're having an alcoholic beverage, is, is made for buddies. It's, it's a beer that we worked with a company called Griffin Claw that worked with us to get the right flavor profile that uh, pairs well with the pizza. And that would be your traditional meal. I mean, and you'd start with that. And you'd want to really taste the crust light crunchy crust. You'd want the sort of the vinegar bite of the antipasto salad. And if you're a real aficionado, and a lot of people used to do this, they would actually have their salad plate. They would finish their salad, and there would be residue of, let's say, the little bit of vinegar and oil, and they would take the crust, the pizza slice, and lay it right on that and get that little bit of flavor on that crust, yes. similar to putting vinegar on French fries. Like if you're in Canada, I don't think you can get French fries without some kind of vinegar. <laughs> right it's just part of eating french fries right. or you go to carnival same thing right you know they got you know the, the the malt vinegar right there and until you've had it you realize there's is there's a flavor enhancer and that would be the start of the meal and then you'd finish it off with a probably a hot fudge sundae which is sanders hot fudge sanders unfortunately is out right now there i've suspended operations but that's another product the sanders hot fudge been around forever or right. you do if you don't have sanders hot fudge you could do you know, Werner's uh, cooler. You know, just get Werner's and a scoop of ice cream. I mean, yes. and keep it keep it home style. You know, that's the beauty of, of, of Michigan. We have so many cool products. Yes, we do. And I think, again, if you travel the state, you could probably go anywhere and find little pockets of, you know, pasty. You, there's always stuff. Little pockets of wow. Yeah, little pockets of wow. I, yes. That's true. Definitely. If you come into Detroit and even some of the locations we have in the metro Detroit area, because, again, where we open Buddies was always near, like Warren is near the Tech Center. Yep. Dearborn is near Fort Headquarters. Auburn Hills was, you know, near the old old Chrysler. Um, and so every location had a connection to automotive. And Six Mile, the original store, had Ford, Chrysler, and GM. Nice. Within, you know, a five-mile radius. Right. And so, again, and all the engineering tool and die shops. You didn't have tier one, tier two suppliers in, in the 40s and the 30s. You had little tooling, little shops up and down all these different areas that would do contract work for them. Right. And that was a big chunk of our business at the time. But also um, kids. Kids love buddies. You know, and that's the other thing. You know, they love our pizza. It's not too spicy for them. It, it tastes like great cheese bread. I've heard kids say, this is the best grilled cheese I ever had. No, it's, act it's actually a pizza. <laughs> but you could call it grilled cheese if you'd like. Yeah. But no tomatoes. So parents would order a cheese pizza with no tomato sauce. Right. Chop it up, and the kids had a meal, and they loved it. Slowly, they'd get them on the antipasto salad. And then, you know, when I was a manager in the stores, I can't tell you how many times the kids that I would, let's say, bring breadsticks out to or, or kind of, you know, joke around at the table when I did my table visits. Later on, those kids were bringing their kids in. Well, you've been around long enough because that that's exactly what would happen. Wesley, if somebody's listening to this and they want to check out what it is you're doing, find your locations, chase you down on social media, where's the best place for sure, them to do that? Just, just on our website at buddiespizza.com. There's so much information on our site. I mean, you Google Buddies, all kind of things pop up. And really, I mean, whether you're ordering Gold Belly pizzas or now we're doing the all-corner pizzas where you can order basically two smalls together. So if everyone loves corners, that's something fun. I mean, it pretty much highlights the story. It has the locations. You can order online. You can have delivery now through DoorDash. Um, they're really, and again, if you live outside of our market and you can't get to Buddies, of course, you can order from Gold Belly. And pretty soon, uh, Buddies will be in a lot of stores around the country. So you'll be able to get a frozen version of Buddies where you can just get it and get an idea. But if you want original and authentic, just to kind of see where it all began, then you come to Six Mile. You go to Detroit. I mean, Detroit is, I don't know if anyone's been to Detroit lately. I was just there this morning. But it's an amazing city right now. It is. When you drive through there, and I was driving there probably for the last 50 years, to be honest, to see what's happened in the last 15 years with Dan Gilbert, Mike Gillich, Peter Carmanos, 
uh, Penske. You can go down the list of all these major guys that all added something to this formula. And, you know, Mike Illich, you know, and Peter Carmanos were the first down there, and then Dan Gilbert came in and just put on steroids. These are great people. Yes. That, that, and when you see the money they invested and you see the other people they brought alongside with them to, to move this city along and to see how you see people on the street cleaning up. I've been to Chicago. I've been to New York. Believe me, our downtown is 20 times cleaner than any I've seen in Manhattan. It is. Yeah. Chicago's areas are clean. Detroit is 20 times cleaner downtown. You go, I drove down Woodward yesterday. I couldn't, I was staring for pieces of paper. I didn't find, see one. Everybody's walking around with the scooper, with the brush. Uh, people are positive. You know, a lot of pride. A lot of color down there. They, they've, they've enhanced a lot of the buildings. Now they're doing murals. Uh, the lighting is fantastic. The restaurant scene is a lot of small little places. Chefs really investing. Right. And Detroit always had a great food scene. I don't know if people realize this, but read about Detroit in the 20s. It was called the Paris of the Midwest, believe it or not. Oh, I did not know that. The theaters, everything. Just read about the city and where it was. And you, when you visit it, we have a store downtown on, in the old Madison Theater, which was one of the first theaters to show mo, uh, action motion picture with sound. <laughs> it, it was converted <laughs> later. We're, Buddy's is in, in the bottom of it. Right. That's our downtown location. And then we have our original location. It's on the east side of Detroit where it all began. Still very busy there. It's at Six Mile Kona, and that's what I would suggest. You start with that, and it's uh, when, you, when you've been around for 77 years, it's worth a look. Yes, definitely. Wesley, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me, Cliff, and we're proud to represent Detroit and Michigan. Represent. And thank you for, for allowing us this voice. We really appreciate that. Hey, no problem. It's been great. And for our audience, you can always roll on over to TotalMichigan.com. Click on Wesley's interview and get all the links that he mentioned above. We'll see you next time with another great story from an ordinary Michigander doing some pretty extraordinary things. See you then.